Edward Arnold. The American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present Mr. President. Mr. President of home in the White House, the elected leader of our country, our fellow citizen and neighbor. These are little-known stories of the men who've lived in the White House. Dramatic, exciting events in their lives that you and I so rarely hear. The true human stories of Mr. President. Now, Edward Arnold as Mr. President. Let's visit him in the White House. It's evening, and the old mansion is quiet, resting from the day's activities. Only one window shows the light. We enter and find ourselves in the president's study. Hello? Sit down, won't you? What would you say if I were to tell you the White House was haunted? <laughs> no, it isn't a ghost story. It's true. And our ghost wasn't one of those fellows that appears only at midnight. This one was a much more threatening ghost and seemed quite real. Which president was I? Well, later on I'll tell you. Meanwhile, see if you can guess. One day I was coming in from a walk with my new Secretary of the Interior. Uh, Jim, we've got a lot of things to talk over. You'd better stay for lunch. No, I'd be happy to, Mr. President. That's fine. I only have to tell Miss Sarah. Huh? Oh, but <laughs> maybe I hadn't better stay for lunch. Oh, come <laughs> now, Jim. Miss Sarah isn't as bad as all that. Well, here we are. Uh, Miss Sarah. Yes, Mr. President. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Martin? Welcome back to Washington. Nice to see you again, Miss Sarah. Uh, Miss Sarah, Mr. Martin's going to have luncheon with me. Oh, that's very nice. Today. Oh. What's the trouble? It's almost 12 o'clock. <clears throat> Mr. President, hmm? I recognize the sign. What? Oh, oh. oh. Uh, every time at home that I produce an unexpected guest at the last minute... Uh, Mrs. Martin gets the same look on her face that Miss Sarah has now. Oh, no, really, Mr. Martin. I didn't mean that. I'm all, sorry, but... Miss Sarah. I've done it again, haven't oh, I? Well, it's only that a meal, even a simple one, has to be planned. Uh, I'm afraid this will upset Mrs. Brown very much. Oh, look, Miss Sarah. Mrs. Brown won't be too upset. You always handle her so well. Mr. President, I'm afraid flattery won't result in a better luncheon. However, I'll go and talk to her. I believe she's on her way to the basement for some of your favorite fruit preserves. Oh. Just coming down to talk to you. Oh, it touched me, Miss Sarah. Uh, touched you? On the shoulder like this from behind. Just a light touch it was, like a faint breeze or the hand of a child. I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about, Mrs. Brown. Well, just now I was in the cellar. I opened the door into the farthest room, and that's when it touched me. Mrs. Brown, what touched you? Well, what could it be but a ghost? Uh, did you see it? Anybody can see a ghost, Miss Sarah. It's not everyone who's touched by a ghost. Oh, I'm sure it was your imagination, Mrs. Brown, or a faint breeze from somewhere. You don't believe in ghosts, Miss Sarah? How can you not? Mrs. Brown, will you promise me something? What is it? Don't mention this to the other servants. What if they to meet it themselves? Oh, we'll worry about that when it happens. Oh, you'll change your mind, Miss Sarah, when the ghost touches you. Mrs. Brown, the president, has an important guest. He's invited him for luncheon. Very well, Miss Sarah. Excuse me, Mr. President. Lunch ready, Miss Sarah? Yes, I'm afraid there'll be a little delay. Mr. President, I knew I should have come back later. No oh, nonsense, Jim. Miss Sarah, uh, will it be very long? Uh, well, the trouble is, Mrs. Brown is upset. Just because of one guest for lunch? No, Miss Sarah. Well, she oh, says Ms. she met a ghost in the cellar. A ghost? <laughs> <clears throat> Was she any happier to see him than she is to see me? <laughs> <laughs> Rather weird little person, Mr. Martin, and she didn't exactly see the ghost. It 
touched her, she says. In any case, Mr. President, if you don't mind waiting a little. Well, you can't blame this on me, Miss Sarah. It still doesn't change the principle of the thing, Mr. President. I'll tell you the moment luncheon is ready. <laughs> a ghost. <laughs> well, I suppose it would be more surprising if the White House didn't have a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm afraid I don't like him. I'm getting hungry. Oh, I don't mind waiting. Jim, I haven't told you yet how glad I am you decided to come into my cabinet. The Department of Interior needs a man of your experience. Oh, it was only a year as Commissioner of the Land Office, Mr. President. But you know, oddly enough, that experience may come in handy. Is that so? Uh-huh. Uh, about a year ago, some undeveloped coal properties in Alaska were sold by the land office to a group of New Yorkmen and Sears. Uh, they're known as the Cunningham Coal Land. Yes, I think I remember that. But the transaction was never completed. The deeds became snarled in official red tape, and the final survey of the properties was never made. In over a year? Why not? Well, that's the odd part. The land office agent in Alaska, a man named Conrad has delayed making the final survey. Deliberately? Well, I found a letter from him in the files, Mr. President. He said that uh, turning these lands over to the people who bought them was in violation of the government's policy on conserving natural resources. Well, do you know of any reason why the final survey shouldn't be made and the sale completed? Mm, that depends on how you want to apply your policy. Jim, we have only two reasons for disposing of undeveloped public lands. One is that we raise some revenue. The important reason, however, is that the lands are developed. That's especially true in the case of Alaska. Some people say that the word developed really means exploited. Laid waste, ruined, uh, like so much of our timberland. I know that. It's true that many of our natural resources have been hurt by thoughtless exploitation. And we're going to do something about that. But that's not the question here. Did Conrad give that as his reason for objecting to the sale? He doesn't give any reason, Mr. President. In fact, his letter's very odd. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do. Since this particular transaction was begun in good faith, it must be completed the same way or we violate the law. After that, I think it will be time for me to advance a plan I've been thinking about that will solve this whole thing. Jim, you go ahead and order that uh, final survey made and then we'll see what... Oh, yes? Mr. President. Uh, yes, Miss Sarah. Oh, I know what you're going to say. Luncheon is ready. <laughs> <laughs> Telegram for you from Jeffrey Paris of the Department of Agriculture, sent from Seattle. Oh, let me see it. On my return to Washington, beg privilege of early appointment to discuss sale of Cunningham coal lands in Alaska. Hmm. What, Jeffrey's Paris? What has he got to do with this? I want. All right, Miss Sarah. Let him have an appointment as soon as he gets back. <laughs> Your second breakfast. I'll put it on the desk, will you, Ralph? Uh, yes, sir. There's a coffee bun and a glass of milk for you. Oh, good, good. Mmm. Uh, Ralph, you couldn't think any of that maple syrup in here, could you? Mm, you know, put on this coffee bun. Mm, it's so, uh, <laughs> it's so dry. Uh, I would have, Mr. President, only maple syrup's not on your diet, sir. Oh, so you don't think I can t talk Miss Sarah out of that, eh? Oh, Miss Sarah is the easiest woman in the world to persuade, providing she agrees with you in the first place. Oh, you leave her to me, Ralph. Meanwhile, you go and get that maple syrup. I mean now, Ralph. Well, sir, there's a little trouble about it. Trouble? What kind? The maple syrup is kept in the cellar. Oh, well, that's all right. I'll wait. Uh, the cellar's where Miss Brown met that ghost. Oh. <laughs> Do you think the ghost drank the maple syrup? Oh, no, sir. I was only thinking... Yeah, you were thinking maybe there, there is a ghost, huh? And you don't want him to touch you. Well, sir, I wouldn't mind meeting a ghost on Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, shaking hands with a ghost out in the broad daylight. But having a ghost tiptoe up behind you and reach out and... Uh, Mr. President, it'd be a shame if you had maple syrup and busted your diet. <laughs> All right, Ralph. I'll stick to it this time, but I warn you. Excuse me, Mr. President. Mr. Paris is here. He has an appointment. Good. Have him come in, will you please? Uh, Ralph, uh, take the rest of this bun away. It's too dry. Oh, yes, sir. Only it's better you stuck to your diet, Mr. Yes, President. Yes, well, I'll do that. Will you please go in, Mr. Paris? Thank you. Mr. President. Come in, sir. Let me thank you, Mr. President, for the time you're giving me. Oh, not at all, Mr. Paris. How can I help you? I've come to protest the sale of the Cunningham coal lands in Alaska. Well, you're in the Department of Agriculture, aren't you, Mr. Paris? I'd hoped you were aware of that, sir. Oh, I was. 
And that's why I don't understand your interest in something that belongs to the Department of the Interior. A terrible tragedy looms ahead for this country, Mr. President. Different people tell me that a dozen times every day, Mr. Paris. I refer to the waste and destruction of our natural resources. Once this was the richest continent in the world, a mighty mass of land blessed above all others by the endowments of our Creator. I agree with you, Mr. Paris. But see what's happening. Careless farmers till the soil without knowledge. Ignorant lumberjacks turn our forests into deserts. And our mineral riches? Grubbed from the earth by men who want only immediate dollars, who don't care about the future. Our government must not become a tool of the exploiters. Do you think we have, Mr. Paris? Mr. President, why is Secretary of Interior James Martin in such great haste to sell the Cunningham coal lands to a group of New York financiers? Financiers? Robbers would be a better word. Don't you think that's a little strong, Mr. Paris? And are you implying that Secretary of Martin has some hidden motive? Last year, when James Martin was land office commissioner, he ordered Conrad to survey the Cunningham properties so that the sale could be completed. Why shouldn't he have sent that order? Sir, the government is supposed to use its discretion in disposing of public lands. And you think Martin didn't? Conrad is certain of it. He wrote and begged Mr. Martin for delay and reconsideration. Then Mr. Martin left the land commission office. On his entering your cabinet recently, almost his first act was to order the survey made. He seems so interested in this sale that we don't believe he's putting the country's interests first. No? Then whose? His own, Mr. President. Are you charging him with corruption? Before taking government office, Secretary Martin was retained as legal counsel by this group of New York financiers, the very ones who want to buy the Cunningham properties. Didn't you know that? And you're implying that he's still serving the interests of those people? What else can I think, Mr. President? Mr. Paris, you're making a grave accusation against the integrity of a man in my official family. I must ask that you not repeat this conversation to anyone and to wait till I call on you for further information. That's exactly what I hoped you'd say, Mr. President. Good day, Mr. Paris. Good day, Mr. President. Miss Sarah, will you come in, please? Coming, Mr. President. Miss Sarah, will you ask Secretary Martin to come and see me... This afternoon? No, no. Uh, wait a moment. I... <laughs> I can't believe what Paris said. Was it serious, Mr. President? Well, I always thought Martin was one of the finest, most upright men in Washington. And now there's a ghost. Uh, beg your pardon, a ghost? A real one, Miss Sarah. Oh. The kind I'm really afraid of. The ghost of doubt and suspicion. I know Jim Martin is an honest man, but in spite of myself, I begin to wonder. That's what a real ghost can do to you. But there must be something you can do about it. I have to do something about it. You see, I'm planning on putting before Congress an entirely new and broad conservation policy. Yes? Well, both the Department of the Interior and the Department of Agriculture are concerned with conservation. Don't you see, unless I have the complete support of both departments, that legislation won't stand a chance? Oh, the splintering between two prominent men in each department can wreck the whole plan. It's doubt and suspicion. Ghost, Mr. President? Exactly. Well, ghosts, real or imagined, have to be dealt with. Yes. You can't run away from them, you know. You've got to walk up to them, look them right in the eye, and meet them head on. Then you do want to see Secretary Martin? Yes. Yes, I do. The sooner the better. <laughs> Plain statement of the situation, Jim. I, I don't understand why Paris acts this way, or, or that fellow Conrad. Ghost, Jim. Uh, what? Never mind. I've got one question. Is it true that you were formally retained as counsel by these New York people? Is it true? Well, of course. Oh. Then what is your relationship to them now? Now? Well, none whatever. Mr. President, any suggestion that I stand to make a personal profit out of the sale of the Cunningham lands is a monstrous lie. Yes, and I'll go even further. If I had my way, I wouldn't approve this particular sale or any others like it. You wouldn't, you, and why not? Well, because the way the law stands now, we're compelled to sell public lands without any guarantee that they'll be properly used. But the law is clear. I'm very glad to hear you make that point. Jim, I want to dramatize this issue. The conservation of mineral lands, to be exact. And to do that, it would help if you would request a congressional investigation. Uh, oh. Congressional investigations are like firecrackers, Mr. President. You, you can't ever be sure which end is going to explode. That's quite right. And you were once employed by these people. That'll make it a hard fight. But I don't ask you to, to walk into it without support. 
I'm going to write you a letter exonerating you from suspicion as far as I am concerned. Then if it'll help you, sir, I'll not only ask for an investigation, I'll insist upon it. Thank you very much, Jim. Goodbye, Mr. President. Goodbye. Mr. President. Yes? That ghost again. What, Mrs. Brown's ghost? Three of the servants have quit just like that. Well, get new ones, Miss Sarah. Who don't believe in ghosts? Mr. President, running a house like this is a job. Servants have to be trained. I wouldn't be surprised if more of the staff were to leave. And next week you have a dinner for Senator Hughes. Miss, Miss Sarah, remember what I said about ghosts? That you can't run away from them? No, you walk up to them, look them right in the eye, and meet them head on. You know, I think I'll take your advice, Mr. President. I'm going down into that cellar. Is that where the ghost lives? According to Mrs. Brown, that's his favorite place. If you meet the ghost, Miss Sarah, remember, look him right in the eye. <laughs> Only me, Miss Sarah. Oh, you startled me. Where did you come from? I came down to see if you saw him, too. Uh, was that you who touched me on the shoulder? You felt it, didn't you? Was that you? Answer me, Mrs. Brown. Well, didn't you see him? Him? The ghost? There is no ghost, Mrs. Brown. A boy, it is. Fifteen years older, thereabouts, with blonde hair and the saddest blue eyes. And he's no ordinary ghost, Miss Sarah. Ordinary ghosts don't touch people. What do you think he wants? Well, maybe he wants... <gasps> Mrs. Brown, this is nonsense. You've upset all the other servants with this talk. They're beginning to think they've seen him, too. Now, I want to hear no more about it. Do you hear? Well, there's no call to get angry, Miss Sarah. Besides, it don't do no good to be angry at a ghost. <laughs> Gentlemen of the Senate Investigating Committee, I now formally open our inquiry into the operation of the land office of the Department of Interior and to Secretary Martin. I've already placed in record a letter from the President, Secretary Martin, in which the White House expresses complete confidence in the Secretary. However, it is now my duty to place another letter in the record. Mr. I... Chairman! Yes, Mr. Paris? As the writer of that letter, may I read it into the record myself? No, yeah, I see no reason why not, Mr. Paris. Will you step up here to the witness chair, please? Thank you, sir. Yeah, Proceed, Mr. Paris. Gentlemen, the great conflict now being fought is to, de to decide for whose benefit our national resources are to be conserved, whether for the benefit of the many or the use and profit of the few. This is the heart of this conservation problem today. This investigation has come about largely because of the insistence of myself and others like me that there is too much going on behind the scenes which we do not know about. Yet, in advance of this inquiry, the President has seen fit to whitewash his Secretary of the Interior, I say, on insufficient evidence or on no evidence at all. Mr. Perry. Yes, Senator? You heard me state that this inquiry was directed at the conservation policy, did you not? I did, sir, but... Now I you seek to turn it into a personal investigation of Secretary Martin. And you have virtually called the president a liar. I want only one thing, the truth. As chairman of this committee, I now call a recess to determine whether we will discuss your letter as a piece of effrontery or make it the basis for formal charges against Secretary Martin. <laughs> Mr. Paris, I don't understand what you're trying to do. I'm trying to make this government's conservation policy mean what it says. You've implied that I'm a liar and that Martin is a crook. Instead of clarifying the situation, you've turned the investigation into a trial of Jim Martin. Is that what you want? The whole situation has got to be aired. Aired? All you're doing is casting doubt and suspicion on an honest public servant. He's as anxious as you and I to see this thing corrected. I'm sorry, Mr. President. Besides, you're making it harder for me to put forward a plan I have. I? And how? By making, making people suspicious of each other's motives. Mr. Paris, I believe you are sincere in your desire for a sound conservation policy. 
as we all are. Thank you, Mr. President. Now, you can help me to see that the necessary changes are made by withdrawing that letter. May I go, Mr. President? I'm afraid I have nothing more to say. Well, that's all for today, Mr. President. Uh, thanks, Miss Sarah. Is there anything else before I go? No, no, thank you. May I say something, Mr. President? Yes, of course, of course. You know, it, it's three weeks since I've heard you laugh. Is it the Martin investigation? Well, partly. Is there any way I can help? Can you drive away ghosts? <laughs> I tried once, nearly frightened myself to death. <laughs> <laughs> I know Martin's an honest man. I believe Paris is, and Conrad, too. Yet look at them in this investigation, calling each other liars, hinting about motives, reasons. Trying to destroy each other. They've made you doubt them, too, haven't they? That's the worst part of it. And I know better. How do you fight off ghosts like that, Miss Sarah? You told me yourself. Look them right in the eye. Yeah, I know. I've tried that. And it wasn't successful for you, either? No, not this time. Not this time. Oh, uh, tell me, is Mrs. Brown's ghost still prowling? Oh, has the whole staff in a ridiculous state of terror? Where is Mrs. Brown now? She's in her room, I suppose. Well, I'm going to try a little experiment, Miss Sarah. Ask Mrs. Brown to meet me in the cellar. Is this where you saw him, Mrs. Brown, here in the cellar? This is where he touched me, Mr. President. I swear it was. Well, let me put on some lights, Mrs. Brown. Hmm? Now, look around, Mrs. Brown. Look around. Tell me if you see any ghosts. Uh, oh, he, he doesn't like to show himself in the light. Oh, I'll bet you he doesn't. And when he, go, when he does show himself in the dark, he isn't really there. Oh, he is. He is. Uh, Mrs. Brown, why did you invent this ghost? Oh, I didn't. I don't deny you believe you have seen this little boy, but it's your imagination. There's no such thing as a ghost, Mrs. Brown. Now, come on. Won't you tell me? Nobody likes me, Mr. President. Oh. None of them. And they won't talk to me ever. None of the servants. I wanted to frighten them, and I did. Oh, you don't understand. Oh, I think I do, Mrs. Brown. You, the president, with your life full of people who admire you and pay attention to you, do everything you ask of them. Oh, you're never lonely. Mrs. Brown, no one needs to be lonely. Every one of us is necessary to someone else. Me necessary? To all of us here in the White House. What I do isn't important. Nobody Will cares. you make me a promise? Will you promise me you will stop thinking about whether or not you're lonely and try to help the others? I, I that... don't understand, Mr. President. Well, make me that promise, Mrs. Brown, that instead of thinking of your own loneliness, you'll try to make friends and help the other servants to be happy. You'll never want to see that ghost again or frighten anybody with him. Will you promise, Mrs. Brown? I'll try, Mr. President. I'll promise you that much. I'll try. That's fine. Good morning, Mr. President. Morning. They're here. Both of them, Miss Sarah? I put Secretary Martin in one room and Mr. Paris in another. Good. Have you heard from the Senate? Yes, this message just arrived. It's very good news, Mr. The formal President. notice that Jim Martin was cleared? Yes. The Senate committee completely repudiated Mr. Paris's letter. This should drive away the ghosts entirely, shouldn't it? No, no, not quite. There's another ghost. Unless I, unless I can get Martin and Paris to face it with me, I'll lose everything that I've been trying to do. These men have got to cooperate with this plan of mine or it'll fail. All right, have them both come in. Mr. Martin, Mr. Paris, I appreciate your coming here. It's perhaps embarrassing for both of you. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, believe me, I, I'm so glad the investigation is over. I can't be angry at anybody or embarrassed. Mr. Paris, for a long time, I couldn't see how to bring this situation to an end. It seems to have ended already, Mr. President. I mean, with a really good result. Here I've had to sit by for weeks and watch you two try to destroy each other. I've watched a young man, Conrad, risk his career. And why? We believed we had good reason. Now look here, Paris. Just a moment, gentlemen, just a moment. 
Both of you are devoted public servants. Both of you are in favor of conservation. But instead of seeing that differences of opinion can be sincere, you threw doubt and suspicion on each other. Unreal doubt and suspicion. And now do you see how destructive that can be? Are you getting my point? Once you said something to me about ghosts, Mr. President. Ah, no, 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 no. They don't exist. Except here, in your mind. The only trouble is, if you believe in them, they do exist. What I'm trying to do now is let in some daylight. You see? Mr. President, you spoke once to me of a plan you had for public mineral lands. Are you asking that both of us support you? <laughs> well, you've hit it, Mr. Paris. I'm going to ask Congress to set up a Bureau of Mines in the Department of the Interior. A first step toward conserving our national wealth. The whole plan will fail without proper support from both the Department of Agriculture and the Interior. Well, gentlemen, I need your combined support. Will I have it? Of course, Mr. President. And you, Mr. Paris? It'd be hard for me not to support it, wouldn't it, Mr. President? <laughs> <laughs> Miss Sarah? Well, is everything all right now, Mr. President? Oh, yes, fine, fine. I just wanted to say that Jim Martin and Paris are staying for dinner. Mr. President, it's a quarter to six. Really? Really, I, I can't expect Mrs. Brown to throw just anything on the table. Miss Sarah, are you sure you're not creating a ghost of your own? What? Isn't Mrs. Brown's concern over an additional guest just a figment of your own imagination? But on such short notice, Miss Sarah, Mr. if I live to be a hundred, I'll never understand why the cook can't fix a couple of extra chops and throw in another potato. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. President, I'll tell Mrs. Brown to throw in another <laughs> potato. You. Oh, Miss Sarah. Yes, uh, Mr. Maybe Mr. it wouldn't strain our staff relations... Too much if you made that two extra potatoes. Eh? <laughs> All right, Mr. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night, Mr. Sarah. Now I wonder if you've been able to guess which president I was when all this happened. Well, the time was 1910. And that means that William Howard Taft lived in the White House then. Mr. President, come and see me again next week, won't you? I'll have another story for you about the White House and Mr. President that I'm sure you'll enjoy. Good night. Appears by arrangement with Metro Golden Mayor. Producers of the Technicolor Picture Unfinished Dance, starring Margaret O'Brien with Sid Charisse, Karen Booth, and Danny Thomas. <laughs> Mr. President is presented each week by the American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations. It is produced by Robert G. Jennings, directed by Dwight Hauser. Miss Sarah is played by Betty Lou Gerson. Tonight's story by Paul R. Milton was suggested by incidents in the administration of President William Howard Taft. Music was composed and conducted by Basil Adlin. Again next week, when Edward Arnold brings you another story of Mr. President, this is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. <laughs>